Ecclesiastes. Chapter number 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. And we left off uh, last time there. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 14. Solomon says, Ecclesiastes 8, 14. There is a vanity which is done upon the earth, that there be just men unto whom it happeneth, according to the work of the wicked. Um, again, there be wicked men to whom it happeneth according to the work of the righteous. I said that this also is vanity. Another observation that Solomon made was the injustice and unfair treatment of different people. Injustice reveals the half-witted, foolish reasoning of people. He noticed that sometimes righteous people were treated as if they were wicked. In Proverbs 17, 13, Whoso rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. Cruelty will afflict and trouble your own home. There is no getting away from it. When good is rewarded with evil, you're going to reap the consequences of such treachery. There are several examples of this in the Bible, by the way. Uh, Noah, a godly father, uh, saved his son Ham and Ham's wife from the flood by his personal righteousness, but when he sinned against his father, Ham's family tree was perpetually cursed. Uh, David killed Goliath and served King Saul well, but Saul was jealous of this godly man and tried to kill him. The result was God's destruction of Saul's family. The, uh, the ruling power of the tribes was given to the tribe of Judah. Thank you, buddy. The Lord Jesus befriended and honored Judas Iscariot as one of his twelve apostles. But Judas chose to betray Jesus for pieces of silver. Uh, I've heard messages through the years, what will you betray Jesus for? Uh, and Judas Iscariot betrayed him for pieces of silver, for money. A lot of people betray the Lord for money. They get out of the will of God for money, quit going to church because they want to make a lot of money, quit serving God because they want to make a lot of money, quit trying to win souls because they want to make a lot of money. Uh, the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they went after it. They coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. 1 Timothy 6.10 uh, The guilt was more than Judas could handle and he ended his life. If we're unjust in our treatment with other people, rewarding them with evil for the good they've done, we are going to have problems. Solomon warned that the consequences of this action was evil <coughs> will not depart from our home or family. Evil means distress, misery, or calamity. This is what will plague your home and my home, evil, uh, sin. King David is an illustration of the truth of this. He rewarded the good of Uriah with the evil of his adulterous relationship with Uriah's wife Bathsheba. He also placed him in a position on the battlefield where he knew he would be killed by the Ammonites. David also despised God's goodness by snubbing his commands. Nathan the prophet delivered God's message to David that his future would be very difficult. Here's what Nathan said. 2 Samuel 12, verse 9 and 10. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with a sword and has taken his wife to be thy wife, and has slain him with the sword of, his, of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine home, from thine house, of your home, his home. Because thou hast despised me and hast forsaken, or hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. So uh, God pronounces through Nathan judgment upon David and his house. And he says, now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house. And you look at David, with all the problems he had in his home, his family. I mean, we'll go over it here in the next few minutes. I mean, it was one thing after another. David's sin was as if he had disturbed, it was as if he had disturbed a colony 
of wild bees. And as a consequence, he was stung throughout the rest of his life. His constant sting. Yeah. Yeah. You say, how long? For the rest of his life. Yeah. You say, ten years? No, the rest of his life. And uh, the remainder of his life would be as a disaster. Would be as disastrous as the beginning had been victorious. Who can tell the far-reaching effects of just one sin. As we've mentioned many times, sin will take you further than you want to go, it'll keep you longer than you want to stay, it'll cost you more than you want to pay. And uh, the price tag of David's treachery was compounded by the interest of iniquity. He sowed the wind, but reaped the whirlwind. You always reap more than you sow. Yeah. Yeah. Any farmer knows that. Uh, just as he took the sword to cover his sins, the sword did not depart from his house. His house was marked by death. He reaped fourfold what he did to Uriah. Mm -hmm. Four things. You say, what are they? First, uh, the baby conceived by David, David and Bathsheba died shortly after birth. God took that baby. And uh, David prayed all night about it. You read that in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. And David said, who knows whether God will be merciful, basically. And he said, uh, he prayed all night and, and so forth. And, uh, and then the baby died. And David said, I can't, uh, the baby can't come to me, but I can go to the, the baby. Uh, Amnon was murdered by Absalom. Uh, Absalom was killed by Joab. David killed someone's son, and his sons were killed. Joab was the agent to kill Uriah. And he was the agent in the death of Absalom uh, too. Adonijah was executed by Solomon. David and his adultery took someone's wife in secret. His, wife, his wives were taken publicly. Remember that, 1 Samuel 30. Absalom took David's harem after the king had to flee. By taking Bathsheba, David defiled someone's daughter. David's daughter Tamar was defiled by Amnon, so he had... Uh, Ammon and Tamar there, physical relations within the family there. Uh, so David reaped all kinds of stuff because of his adultery. And he reaped it in his family. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Yeah. So whatever, whatever, whatever you sow, David sowed adultery. That shall he also reap. He sowed it in his family. M many times. Uh, the key lesson of David's failure is no matter what, who you are, if you sin, it will find you out. God never allows his children to sin successfully. God, he don't allow anybody, but especially God's children. And God doesn't allow saints of God to sin successfully. And uh, if, if you reward evil for good, evil will not depart from your house. Going on in Ecclesiastes 8.15. Ecclesiastes 8.15 Then I commended mirth because a man hath no better thing under the sun. There's that expression, under the sun, again. He uses that several times here in this book. Uh, than to eat and to drink and to be uh, merry. For that shall abide with him of his labor the days of his life which God giveth him under the sun. So uh, he's not advocating, Solomon's not advocating the wickedness of the rich fool in Luke 12, 19, who left God out of his life and died that very night. The Lord wants us to enjoy our lives. He giveth us richly all things to enjoy, 1 Timothy 6. Uh, so God's blessings, and he wants to enjoy his blessings, he's given to us. You can enjoy what God has given to you by honoring Him and thanking Him for what He has given you. Putting Him first and recognizing that the Lord is your source of blessing will bring great joy to you. The only reason why you have what you have is because of God. Amen. You say, no, I work for it. God allowed you to, with yeah. health and strength yeah. to work and to make money and to buy things and to have things. And if it wasn't for the grace of God, we'd all be in a wheelchair and we'd all be in the hospital looking out of a window right now, like many people are around America. Uh, so uh, we're to enjoy God's blessings. 
He says here in verse 15, Then I commended mirth, because a man hath no better thing under the sun than to eat and to drink and to be merry. All right? So God wants us to enjoy, he wants us to enjoy our life, our Christian life. He, he, uh, I am coming, they might have life, they might have it more abundantly. John 10, verse 10. All right? Uh, and then verse 16, going on. Ecclesiastes 8, 16. This is the investigation for wisdom. When I applied mine heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done upon the earth, for also there is that neither day nor night seeth sleep with his eyes. Seeking wisdom and studying are hard work. The more one studies, the more mysteries and puzzles that are hard to understand or observe. This creates further investigations and work. If a person attempts to answer all the unknown <coughs> mysteries, he is troubled day and night and becomes a stranger to sleep. In some cases, he finds the answers to the puzzles. In other matters, the secrets are elusive. This is what he's saying in verse, uh, chapter 8, verse 16. When I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done uh, upon the earth, for also there is that neither day nor night see asleep with his eyes. So some people can't even hardly sleep because they're trying to seek these different things. Verse 17, Then I beheld all the work of God that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun, because though a man labor to seek it out, yet he shall not find it. Yea, further, though a wise man think to know it, yet shall he not be able to find it. I found out the older I've gotten, I, you know, you've heard the expression, we've all used it, but, and it's true. It's not just an expression. I found out that the older I get, not only do I not know the answers, I don't even know the questions yeah. a lot of times. And that's the truth. The, the older you get, the more ignorant you realize you are, I think. Yeah. Really. I mean, you know, when you're young, you think you know everything a lot of times, you know, and think you got all the answers and stuff. I think it's when you, as you grow older, you realize there's a lot of things you don't know. And uh, one thing that's hard for some people to do is to admit their ignorance on certain matters. I've told you, we come across verses in our verse-by-verse -verse studies. I'll tell you what, there's verses in, uh, there's verses in uh, Proverbs, and uh, there's verses in Isaiah, and Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Uh, there's some verses in Daniel. I told you, I said, I really don't know what that is. A lot of it's prophecy, prophetic stuff. There's some stuff in Revelation we went over. I didn't, sometimes I couldn't give a full explanation about it. I can tell you what I thought it means. Uh, you know, I think it means or whatever, but I don't really know. There's some verses in uh, some books in the Bible that it's like I don't have a clue what they mean. Amen. And I'll tell you, I don't know what they mean. Sorry. Because like one man said, he said, if I knew everything uh, in this Bible, I'd know that somebody wrote it that wasn't any smarter than me. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, thank God that that's not true. God's, of course, omniscient. He knows everything. Pride keeps people from doing this from admitting that they're ignorant about certain things. People don't want to look bad or feel, you know, feel dumb. It's, it was the famous historian Will Durant, author of the multi-volume set Story of Civilization, who said about mankind, quote, Our knowledge is a receding mirage in an expanding desert of ignorance. Our knowledge is a receding mirage in an expanding desert of ignorance. In other words, we don't know as much as we think we know. I mentioned right. many times, think about a God that we serve, the God we serve, he knows everything. He don't have to go to college. I mean, you know, I mean, to do heart surgery, to do brain surgery, these, these men and women, they have to go to they have to go to college and school for like 12 and 14, 16 years to, I mean, open somebody up and take the heart out and to operate on a heart, put it back in, sew them back up, to do brain surgery. I mean, to do that type of stuff, I mean, but God knows how to do that. He don't have to go to college to, to find out how to do it. He made your brain. He made your heart. He made your eardrum and your ears. He made your eyes, your eye sockets, the brain, your skull, your mouth, your teeth, lips, everything. He made, God is a wonderful God. He's a powerful God. Uh, what we claim to know is actually a mirage. This is especially true of people who think they can get to heaven their own way and by, without receiving Christ as their Savior. They're revealing their ignorance. They think if they get baptized that they're all right. They think if they join a church or they uh, have good works or do this or that or some religious thing that that's going to make them, you know, 
That's going to uh, qualify him to go to heaven. No, you must be born again, Jesus said in John 3, 7. Being born again is not getting baptized. It's not going to church faithfully. It's not uh, having good works. It's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's re realizing you're a sinner, you've sinned against God. The only thing that can wash away your sins is the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Yeah. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. How do you get the blood? You get the blood by receiving the blood, by receiving Christ as your Savior, by being born again of the Spirit of God. Uh, learning and gaining wisdom come from being upfront and honest about your ignorance, as well as being teachable. Admitting your ignorance on a matter is a key step in learning what you don't know. You'll find that many will bend over backwards to help you if you tell people, I don't know. Would you teach me? Would you show me? Would you explain this? What does that mean? I don't know about that. What, is that, what does that mean? If you put up a wall by claiming to be a know-it-all, you'll not recognize wisdom and truth when it stares you in the face. Paul warned, uh, knowledge puffeth up, the charity edify, 1 Corinthians 8, 1, and 8, 2 says, And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. 1 Corinthians 8, 2. Solomon closed this chapter by reminding us of a reality of life. There's just some things we cannot know and will not know, no matter how wise we are or how hard we try to find the secrets. Some things remain unknown for now. Missionary to India, Henry Martin. Henry Martin said, quote, I don't want God to humble me, but I do want to humble myself before him. Although there are many things I do not know, will not change or cannot explain, I am willing to leave these matters with God. I recognize that he will show me what he wants me to see. He will teach me what he wants me to know and tell me what he wants me to hear. He said, that's good enough for me. Amen. Unquote. God did teach uh, Henry Martin. In the last seven years of his life, he translated the New Testament into three difficult Eastern languages. In those years, he found the enjoyment and fulfillment that he searched for for his entire life. Our responsibility as Christians is to learn what we can and obey God, what, uh, what he teaches us in his word. We're to strive to do his will and purpose for our lives. And uh, doing that will help us be a wise as well as a happy person. Chapter 9, verse 1. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 1. For all this I considered in my heart even to declare all this, that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. No man knoweth either love or hatred by all that is before them. Now, uh, a great deal of the book of Ecclesiastes contains thoughts that Solomon shared about his life, or about life itself. He was concerned about his own purpose in life uh, and, it, and, it's, and his own life and its purpose. He studied and researched a number of topics, experiences, as well as people, and thought about what he learned. I heard a preacher say many years ago, right after I got saved, started preaching. He told the preachers, he said, you need to try to read everything you can read. Not, you know, as far as it's not, as long as it's not ungodly, filthy. But he said, you need to try to, you need to try to, read as much as you can read about everything you can read about. Because it'll help you in the ministry. It'll help you in illustrations. It'll help you, uh, when you the, more, the more that you know, the more you know, knowledge puffeth up. There's nothing wrong with having a lot of knowledge. There's a lot of people, they're just, they're just full of information. Their knowledge, they're just, uh, they have a lot of knowledge. Now, using that knowledge... And for the glory of God, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding are all, those three words are used many times in Proverbs. Solomon uses them. We, we've gone over the difference in those all, many times. Knowledge is just a knowledge of facts, knowing a lot of different things about different things, having knowledge. All right? And uh, wisdom is knowing how to use that knowledge for not only your own good, but for the good of God and God's purpose. And that's wisdom. And then uh, having wisdom to know how to use that. A lot of people know a lot of things, but they don't have any wisdom. And then understanding is understanding how that fits in with God and God's plan and uh, using it for the glory of God. Wisdom, understanding, and knowledge are used many times in the book of uh, Proverbs. Uh, uh, Job 28, 28 says, to depart from evil is understanding. That's a good definition of understanding. To depart from evil is understanding. 
when it says there is none that understandeth in Romans 3 and Psalms 53, it doesn't mean that nobody understands what 2 plus 2 is. It's 4. It doesn't mean that nobody understands biology or chemistry or arithmetic or mathematics or geometry or algebra or trigonometry or calculus. It doesn't mean that. What it means is that no, there is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. There is none that understands that. In other words, in their natural unsaved condition, unregenerated condition, there's none that understands that I'm a sinner. I've sinned against a holy God. My sin offends a holy, uh, righteous, sovereign God. And he sent his son Jesus 2,000 years ago to shed his blood. And for my sins, and if I'll trust Christ as my Savior, I can go to heaven. Nobody in their natural condition understands that. You say, what do you mean? Uh, I, I got saved. Yeah, but somebody witnessed to you. Somebody told you about the gospel. Until if God would have let you go the way you were going as an unsaved person, never let anybody, uh, never let anybody come to you and deal with you and talk with you. The Holy Spirit never dealt with you about nothing, and your conscience never convicted you about nothing or anything. If He like just lets you go, you'd have died and split hell wide open. In your natural unsaved condition, yeah. there is none that we are all all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Uh, that's uh, Isaiah 53. So there is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. You say, I sought God. Yeah, after the Holy Spirit dealt with your heart about it. Uh, so uh, Solomon was focused on life under the sun. This happened because he got away from God, disobeyed his commands, and became idolatrous. And you can read about it, as I said many times, in 1 Kings chapters 10 and 11. 1 Kings chapters 10 and 11. It tells the different gods that he went after. The literal God that he went after. Now David had sins of the flesh. And David paid for his sins. We just went over that a few minutes ago. But David never went after other gods in that sense. But his son Solomon did. And uh, so uh, Solomon goes after uh, strange gods and strange women. The nation of Israel was divided under his son's reign, uh, Solomon's. As we go on through the book here, uh, we've seen a gradual change in Solomon's attitude as he began to bring God back into the picture and started to focus on him again. He expressed the importance of the Lord and that he, the Lord, is our source of strength and blessing. See, Proverbs, when Solomon wrote Proverbs, he was right with God. You read Proverbs. Boy, it's got some great verses. It's a wonderful book. But then he, got, he, got, he committed idolatry, got away from God. That's what Ecclesiastes is. That's why Ecclesiastes is written as a man under the sun, the expression under the sun, under the sun. And the first several chapters of Ecclesiastes, I mean, it's just all gloom and doom. Now these last few chapters, he's got right with God, he's going to start getting back to God, and uh, there's a little bit of, uh, you can see him getting back with the Lord uh, from his backslidden condition. Uh, when he started getting back with God and seeing that God's his, his source of strength and blessing, his attitude began to change for the better and was reflected in his message. Here in chapter 9, he shares some clarity that he sought on a number of matters that he had observed and had been thinking about throughout his life. And uh, chapter 9, verse 1 of Ecclesiastes, For all this I considered in my heart, even to declare all this, that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. No man knoweth either love or hatred, by all that is before them. All right. Uh, Solomon considered in his heart. Considered in his heart. Stop thinking about that. He considered in his heart. Have you ever stopped sometimes to consider in your heart about things? Uh, it's amazing what can take place in your life if you'll stop and consider some things in your heart and mind. In fact, the Bible gives a number of things that we ought to consider. He says here in chapter 9, verse 1, for all, this, for all this, I considered in my heart even to declare all this. So he considered some things. Uh, first of all, consider the person of Christ. Hebrews 12, verse 2 and 3, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. That's Hebrews 12, verse 2 and 3. So consider the person of Christ. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Look what he went through. Look how they spit in his face. 
They crucified him. And they beat him beyond recognition. His visage was so marred more than any man. He had a mock trial. People hated his guts. What did he ever do to anybody? He didn't do nothing. All he did, he went about doing good. That shows you the depravity of man. The crucifixion reveals the depravity of mankind. The depravity of the human heart. Mankind hates a sinless man. If you and I were living 2,000 years ago, we were walking around Jesus and watched him and looked at him, we'd be under conviction just by listening to him talk and by watching him, observing him. He never told a dirty joke. He never was around somebody who told a dirty joke, never laughed at a dirty joke, never, never had a cuss word come out of his mouth, never touched a woman in an illicit manner, he never committed fornication and adultery, he never drank booze and alcohol and nothing like that. I mean, he didn't. He was sinless. Think of a being absolutely sinless. He paid for our sins on the cross of Calvary. Amen. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Amen. The whole world. 1 John 2, verse 2. Uh, propitiation means payment. He's our payment. That's why you go to heaven if you're saved. The only reason you're going to heaven is because he paid your payment. Uh, things to consider the person of Christ. Secondly, the prompting of one another to serve and love God. We prompt one another to serve God. Hebrews 10, 24. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Now, provoke don't mean, you know, like little boys and uh, brothers and sisters will provoke each other, get each other mad. They'll get fussed and fight with each other. Right? We're not talking about that provoking like that. All right? We're not talking about, you know, that type of provoking. When Paul talks Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Provoke each other to love and to good works. In other words, try to get each other stirred up to do, to do right. That's the prompting of one another to serve and love God. Thirdly, uh, consider the providential care of God. Pro consider the providential care of God. 1 Samuel 12, 24. Only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things He hath done for you. Yeah. Amen. We ought to take a 15-minute recess here and just run around the building and just praise God for about 15 minutes. Yeah. The providential care of God. Only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things He hath done for you. If we realized how great God is, how big He is, how powerful He is, how all-knowing He is, we would just fall down and just say, God, be merciful to me. Amen. Amen. Lord, you're so wonderful. Number four, we ought to consider the power and works of God. The power and works of God. Job 37, 14. Job 37, 14. Hearken unto this, O Job. Stand still and consider the wondrous works of God. The wondrous works of God. Think about the wondrous works of God. The wondrous works of God. Job 37. Uh, Job 37, verse 14. The power and works of God. So consider the person of Christ, the prompting of one another to serve and love God. Consider the providential care of God. And consider, number four, the power and works of God. Because here in Ecclesiastes 9, 1, Solomon says, For all this I considered in my heart, even to declare all this that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. Number five, consider the prospects of foolish people. The prospects of foolish people. Deuteronomy 32, verse 28 and 29. For they are a nation void of counsel, neither is there any understanding in them. Oh, that they were wise, that they understand, understood this, that they would consider their latter end. Consider their latter end. It grieves my heart when I look at people and know they're going to die and go to hell. Yeah. Folks, I'm telling you, that's why this revival, you ought to try to invite your neighbors, your family, your friends, your everybody you know, invite them out. <clears throat> you say, oh, they'll get mad, they'll, they'll cuss me out, they'll, they'll tell me to shut up. So what? Yeah. What matters? So we have a revival, got some people going to be singing and uh, preaching, you know, and, uh, and tell them to come on out. Just It's just five nights. Five nights, then it's over. 
So get all you can. Get all you can this week, five nights. And uh, number six, the prodigality, prodigal, the pro or waste of worldliness and wayward ways. Consider this. Uh, this about wasting God's money and his, his uh, things that God gives you. That's in Haggai 1, 5 to 7. Haggai chapter 1, verse 5 to 7. Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways, he tells Israel. Now, that's to us too. Consider your ways. Ye have sown much and bring in little. You've, you've sown much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. I was talking to a person here recently. And uh, we talked about a certain individual. It's nobody in this church. But uh, talking about a certain individual. And I said, they were telling me about how this individual, they, they, used, they had a job, they didn't make that much money. And now they're, they got a job and they're making pretty good money. And I looked at this individual and I said, it don't matter how much money they make. No matter if they make 400 a week or 4,000 a week. They will not have anything to show for their money. They'll waste most of it. I'm not talking about anybody in this church. I mean, I hope this don't apply to you. We weren't making reference to anybody in this church. But I said, it's a particular male a guy. And I said, it don't matter if he makes, it don't matter what he makes. Because every time you ask me, you don't have no money. And he makes caboodles of money. You don't have nothing to show for it. And if you ask him what he does with his money, he gets very defenseless. It's a soft spot. I wonder what he's doing with his money. So, uh, ye, ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Consider your ways. So the prodigality, prodigal, prodigality, or waste of worldliness and wayward ways. Number seven, consider the principles of God's word. The principles of God's word. Psalms 119.95. The wicked have waited for me to destroy me, but I will consider thy testimonies. The wicked have waited for me to destroy me. There are people that would like to destroy you. Destroy you. You destroy your children and your grandchildren. Destroy your marriage. Destroy your home. Destroy this church. The principles of God's word number eight. Consider the provocation or hindering of weaker Christians. First <clears throat> Corinthians 8 verse 9. But take heed, Paul said, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. So we're not to be a stumbling block to others. Be careful uh, how you act, where you go, what you do. Number nine, consider the purpose of God's chastisement. Deuteronomy 8.5 Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. And God has various forms of chastening, chastisement. Just as a parent may say, you know, you're not allowed, not allowed to use your cell phone for, you know, a couple days, or you're not allowed to go here or there, or, you know, whatever, chastisement or punishment or whatever. Uh, God has various forms of using the rod of correction to his children. God has different ways of spanking us. And uh, I'm glad he's very merciful, aren't you? <laughs> Praise God. I mean, we'd be a fly, we'd be a swatted fly on the wall, guts, brains, and everything splattered all over the wall if God wasn't merciful. Yeah. Solomon considered and took to heart the greatness of God, the ignorance of man, the purpose of life, and the good, bad, and ugly events that took place in his life. Solomon, in this chapter, wanted to make some matters perfectly clear for us to consider. The king declared that those who are righteous, wise, as well as their works are in the hand of God. This word declared means to make clear, to clear up, explain, and prove. Solomon more or less said, 
Let me make this perfectly clear that our lives, what we do and are able to do, are in God's hands. He's in control. You say, well, that means when I do wrong and I sin, that's God doing it? No, that's you doing it. All right, you're not a robot. You have your own will. All right? We believe in the free will of man. But we're not, we don't believe you can lose your salvation. We believe once you're saved, you're always saved. But we believe that man has a will. And hyper-Calvinists teach that the, the, the depravity extends to the will that you don't even have a will to get saved. That's a perverting of the scriptures. Yeah. Perverting of the scriptures. And uh, so uh, that's, it's just, it, oh, don't get me started. But anyways, he's in control. Uh, he also knows what we do and what we neglect to do. So what a blessing. Being, being in God's hand is a great place to be. And we enjoy a variety of blessings because of God's hand. God's hand. You say, what do we enjoy? God's hand. His hand, let me give you five things about his hand. Uh, five S's. His hand provides satisfaction. Psalms 145, 16. Thou openest thine hand and satisfiest the desire of every living thing. He satisfies the desire of every living thing. You know what that shows you? That only God can make you complete. Only God can satisfy you. Only God can bring real contentment in your life. God has so constituted you and I and every human soul, every human being... <coughs> In this world, I wish the Hollywood people and all these movie stars and actors, entertainers, and all the basketball, and, uh, pro basketball, baseball players, football players, and all the people has got money and fame and all that stuff. And oh, this great person. Oh, I wish they would realize, and everybody else in the whole world would realize that God has so constituted you as a human being that the only thing that really brings real joy, peace, and victory, and contentment in a person's heart and soul and life is A, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, Amen. and B, walking in fellowship with God. Amen. That's it. That's it. You say, that's it? That's it. That's all she wrote, man. Uh, that, that's all God. That's why God's constituted you. Whoever made this watch that I have knows how this watch works. If there's a problem, I can take it to the jeweler. He can, un he can open it up, and he's usually knows how to work the, ins the inside workings of this watch. Because he created it. He made it here. He knows it. He knows the watch. He's like a creator. God created you. He knows what makes you tick. And uh, trying to get to this verse here. Uh, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that's written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. As far as I know, the only time the word success appears in the King James Bible, which is the Word of God, yeah. is in Joshua 1.8. And it has nothing to do at all with what, how big a house you live in, how many beautiful, wonderful vehicles you have, or how much money you have in the bank, or how much retirement Social Security you have. <laughs> Or CDs, or IRAs, or ERA, or NRA, or NRA, or whatever. <laughs> if you have all that, praise God. <laughs> I don't have none of it. But anyways, anyways, but Joshua 1 8 is connected. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then. Well, you, you do according to all that's written there in this word of God, then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. You want to be, people talk about prosperity. Well, here it is, Joshua 1.8. You don't have nothing to do with how rich you are or famous. That's why all these people, these well-known people, they're finding them dead in their motel rooms, drug overdose, yeah. and they're multi-millionaires. Yeah. They're multi-millionaires. Football players, basketball players, baseball players. They got millions and millions of dollars. And not only do they make millions of dollars playing, uh, playing uh, pro athletic sports, 
Then they do all these commercials for all these big major corporations, yeah. and they pay them millions to do the commercials. Uh, Kobe Bryant, he got killed in that helicopter crash here a couple, three years ago, whenever it was. He's a multimillionaire. He made millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars and millions and millions and millions of dollars playing pro basketball. He's a great basketball player. But he died. Was he around 40 years old or something? Left all the millions to his wife. His wife gets all the millions. So what? I wouldn't trade places with her for nothing. She can have it. They can have it. Uh, and then the uh, God's hand provides satisfaction. So he just satisfies the desire of every living thing. We need to learn to find satisfaction in the Lord. The Rolling Stones is a rock group. And uh, I used to listen to it before I got saved. And had their eight tracks back in the 70s. And all that. But they had sang a song, I can't get no satisfaction. Yeah. No, they didn't, they can't get no satisfaction. Right. They had multi-millions of dollars. <laughs> they traveled all over the world and sold millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of recording re records and albums and all that stuff through the years. And they're a fornicate and adulterous lifestyles. And everything else. And now they're all in their 70s. I think one or two of them are dead. But uh, Mick Jagger's not. And uh, they say, I can't get no satisfaction. You can't get no satisfaction in the things of this world. Right. Only God can bring true Amen. satisfaction. Amen. He sang that song. That's true. I can't get no satisfaction. He's right. Tell it like it is. Those things don't bring satisfaction. And joy and peace. Some, if you read the testimonies of some of the richest people in the world in the last 200 years, they were some of the most miserable people on the face of this earth. You say, yeah, but I still wish God would give me a, a million dollars, preacher. I, I tell you what, I, I, you wouldn't know what to do. A lot of people wouldn't know what to do with a million dollars. And if you, if you thought you didn't know when you got it, I mean, people would be trying to break into your house and holding your kids and grandkids as a ransom for money. Your whole life would change. These people that won these lotteries, their whole life changed. And usually it went downhill. I told you about that guy in West Virginia that won that lottery years ago. I don't forget, I forget how many millions and millions. He was already rich. He's a big contractor all over the state of West Virginia. And he won. He got on television and said, I'm going to give money to my church. And oh, he was just so happy. I think he won like two or three hundred million dollars. That's after tax, after they took all the tax stuff out of it. Well, they found his new truck at a strip joint yeah. in West Virginia, and it had been broken into, and a bunch of cash that he had in there. I don't know why he had cash in his truck. A bunch of money he had in his truck was stolen, of course. They showed his little granddaughter, pretty little girl, 18 years old, got on drugs. She died, drug overdose. I think he had two or three, at least two grandkids, kids or grandkids that died of drug overdose. Their life was a total mess. I mean, he went through, he went through a divorce. All this, and his wife was on television, they interviewed her, and she was bawling like a baby, crying. And she said, if I would have known what was going to happen, when he won, he got that lottery ticket. He won that. He won all this. We won all this millions and millions and millions of dollars. If I would have known how our lives were going to be, there was a lot of other negative things that happened in their lives. I can't remember all of them now. It was like 10 or 15 years ago. She said, if I would have known what was going to happen in our lives, she said, I would have tore the ticket up. Amen. You think the average American would have tore the ticket up? Ah! His hand, why is that? Because unless, there are, there are some people that know how to handle a lot of money. They would use it uh, prudently, uh, frugally. 
They would know how to invest it. They would know how to give it to the Lord's work, to missions and things like that. In the gospel, uh, my wife and I heard the other day there. Who was it? Uh, I think it was Bill Gates, and well, I think him and his wife are divorced now. But Bill Gates, you know, the multi-billionaire, B is in boy, billionaire. He gave 1.2 billion, I think, or something like that, to some charity or something to find research for some. I forget what it was. I mean, you know, it was. Uh, it might have been a decent call. I don't know. You know, I think it was some kind of medical research or something. But I told my wife, I said, think if he'd have given that to missions, one point two billion to Bible believing missionaries. I'm talking about that are getting souls <laughs> saved, getting churches established, and things like that. I'm talking about. I ain't talking about going over the field and playing around. His hand provides his hand provides satisfaction. His hand provides strength and courage. Ezra 7, 28. And I was strengthened as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me, and I gathered together out of Israel chief men to go up with me. Well, I'm glad for the strength of God's hand. Thank God for his hand of blessing. He enables us to become what He wants us to be. Jesus said, for without me, you can do nothing. John 15, 5. Imagine me standing up here telling you, I want you to know that without me, Steve Kogel, you can't do nothing. Folks, Jesus could say that because He was God. Amen. When they fell down to worship Him, He never told them to get up. Peter told Cornelius, he said, get up, I myself also am a man. I mean, Peter stuck his foot in his mouth a lot of times, but he got that right. He said, get up, don't be worshiping me. Acts 10, 25, and 26. Cornelius thought that Peter was the first pope. That's what the Catholic Church teaches. Bless his heart. Wrong again. His hand provides salvation for the lost. Acts eleven twenty one, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. That's what we're trying to get people to do. Turn to God. Turn. Turn. Turn the knob. Turn the door handle. Turn. Turn. You see that? That's, about, that's what we're talking about revival. Matter of fact, I guess those verses just popped in my head. Here. Turn to Lamentations over to the right there, a few books. Uh, Jeremiah. Let's see, Lamentations. Uh, Look over here, uh, I think it's the word turn it just kind of popped in my head here. Lamentations 5, I believe it is. Lamentations 5, verse, Lamentations 5, verse 21. Turn thou us unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned. Renew our days as of old. Don't oh, we need revival, man, revival. But thou hast utterly rejected us, thou art very wroth against us. So uh, 20 says, Wherefore dost thou forget us forever, forsake us so long time? Turn, verse 21, Turn thou us unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned. That's what we need this week in this revival, a good turning. Sometimes we get kind of turned sideways, and, you know, the wrong ways, the wrong direction. You've got to get turned back to God. All right? And then uh, <clears throat> number four, his hand provides security that is eternal. John 10, 28, Jesus said, and I give unto them eternal, my 27, John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life. You're one of his sheep, he gives you eternal life. And they shall never perish. I'm, uh, and I give them eternal life, they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave to me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. <clears throat> I and my Father are one. You know what the next verse says in John 10, 31? They picked up stones to throw them at him. They're going to stone him. You know why? Because he taught two things. He said, I and my Father are one. He's basically saying that he's God. That, that, that stirred them Pharisees up because they thought they were somebody. 
They, it drove them crazy when he'd say, I and my father are one. And he just taught eternal security. Woohoo! Got a shout around the aisles on that one. Religious people, Pharisees, hate the doctrine of eternal security because they want people to believe that you have to work for your salvation. They despise eternal security. There's a lot of Christians. Most Christians in Highland County believe you can lose your salvation. Very, very true. You say most, how many? Uh, at least 90%. Matter of fact, I can count on one hand the number of churches in Highland County. I'm not even talking about a 50, 60 mile radius. I'm just talking about Highland County. I can count on one hand in Highland County. I don't even know if there's five, but I can count on one hand the number of churches that teach that once you're saved, you're always saved, you're eternally secure. They all believe you got to work to get it or work to keep it. Or both. I'm glad it's by grace through faith. Amen. Amen. You know, that never made sense to me when I got saved. Oh, wow. Andy told me, he said, now, I want to show you some eternal security verses because there's going to be people tell you that it won't be, it won't be a week. There'll be some Christian come around and tell you that you've got to hold on. You've got to endure to the end. You know, taking a verse, Matthew 24, 13, out of context, doesn't apply doctrinally to the church age today. It applies to the Jews of the tribulation running for their life. they got to endure to end a period of time. The whole context of tribulation, Matthew 24. You pray that your flight be not in the winter. If you're on the housetop, don't go back and get your stuff. All that. <coughs> and then Matthew 24, 21, he said be, that time will be such a time as never was since the beginning of the world, nor ever shall be. It's a tribulation. Yeah. Has no reference at all to a born-again child of God. As a matter of fact, when the events in Matthew 24 take place, the <coughs> church has already been raptured. Yeah. Woo! Out of here. You see why it's so important to get your Bible right? Yeah. Amen. I mean, really. The Bible ignorance in America is astronomical. And the re it, it, it's revealed by the fact that people don't read their Bible anymore. They don't study their Bible no more. Uh, his hand provides security that's eternal. What peace and comfort we have for the promise of the Lord that the security of our souls are in His hand. When we trust in Christ for salvation, we'll never perish. John 10, 28. And I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Now you've got people say, yeah, but you can still perish. <coughs> Wait a minute now. If Jesus said a Christian will never perish, his sheep, and these all these religious outfits say that you still can perish and go to hell after you're saved, am I going to believe Jesus or am I going to believe them? Jesus. I'm going to believe Jesus. Amen. And that isn't the only verse. There are several other verses that teach eternal security in the New Testament. Then number five, God's hand uh, provides shelter and protection. Shelter and protection. Thank God for that. Isaiah 49, 2. Isaiah 49, verse 2, And he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me, and made me a polished sh shaft. In his quiver hath he hid me. In his quiver hath he hid me. <clears throat> Trusting your life with his care will give you peace and calm. So that's God's hand. All right, uh, I uh, just got a couple minutes here. Uh, Ecclesiastes 9, uh, verse uh, 1. Uh, For all this I considered in my heart, even to declare all this, that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hand of God. No man knoweth neither knoweth either love or hatred by all that is before them. All things come alike to all. There is one event to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good and to the clean and to the unclean. Talk about going to death. We all die. To him that sacrificeth and to him that sacrificeth not, as is the good, so is the sinner. And he that sweareth as he that uh, feareth an oath. Uh, a lot of things here. Whether a person is going to be loved or hated by others, nobody knows what lies ahead in the future except God. Uh, the future in history, the future is history to God, for He is omniscient. The future is history to God. He already knows it. He knows all. For us, there is a black veil on our futures. It's the mystery of tomorrow that leaves some people drowning in fear, while others look forward to it with great expectation. That's especially true for those who know Christ as Savior. Charles Kettering. 
Charles Kettering, I don't know if that's where Kettering, the town of Kettering is named after or not there around Dayton, who was the founder of Delco and head of research at General Motors for 27 years, said, quote, my interest is in the future because I am going to spend the rest of my life there, unquote. Charles was on target and he stated the truth. Uh, there are scriptures that Solomon, uh, as Christians, we do not know what's going to happen in our lives on earth in the future, but after our deaths, we do know some of the things that will happen in heaven. The Lord tells us some basic things with us in the Gospels and in the New Testament epistles. We know that we have a home in heaven. We'll receive a glorified eternal body. We'll receive the inheritance of Christ. We'll be reunited with saved loved ones and friends. We'll live with Christ and the saints for eternity. We also know that those who die without Christ will spend eternity in hell forever and ever. Archbishop Tullison said in the 1600s, he who provides for this life but takes no care for eternity is wise for a moment but a fool forever. A fool forever. 